Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming out on such a beautiful night. I know it's tempting to uh, be out looking at the, the beautiful blooming magnolias and everything else, but you'll have plenty more opportunities to do that. So we have a, a very special program for you this evening. So I'm Mark Hudson. I'm the executive director of Tudor Place, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first program in our 2024 Landmark Lecture Series. This year's series is focusing on the ideas of commemoration and memorialization. And through the six programs we'll be doing this year, we'll be looking at how stories from the past have been remembered both here at Tudor Place and at uh, places throughout our community. But we begin this evening with our Indigenous Land Acknowledgement Statement. We respectfully acknowledge the Nkotchank, Anacostan, and Piscataway people on whose ancestral homelands Tudor Place Historic House and Garden sits. We also celebrate the vibrant native communities who make their homes in the DC area today. The Tudor Place is honored this evening to welcome Judy Scott Feldman, founding member and chair of the National Mall Coalition, an all volunteer nonprofit organization founded in 2000. So almost a quarter century of, uh, of the organization. The, coal the coalition advocates comprehensive visionary planning for the National Mall to ensure the vitality, beauty, and continued active role of this stage for democracy in the capital and in American life. While teaching art history at American University in the 1990s, Judy encouraged students to engage with the controversy surrounding the World War II memorial proposed for the mall. Based on her knowledge of Washington's history, she was invited to join the board of the Committee of 100 on the Federal City and the DC Preservation League and to her surprise, and just like that, she had become an activist and soon went on to found the National Mall Coalition. Judy received her BA and MA degrees in art history from Penn State University and her PhD from the University of Texas. In addition to her work at the National Mall Coalition, she's a lecturer for the Smithsonian Institution, OSHER at Johns Hopkins University, and OASIS Continuing Education Programs. Giving mall talks to tourist groups has given her broad insight into how Americans from all over the country experience the mall and are eager to know more. This evening, she's going to be talking about the National Mall as a commemorative space. So would you please join me in welcoming Judy Scott Feldman. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to talk for a very interested audience. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here. I am a native Washingtonian. I was born here. I grew up in Anacostia on the hills. And I like to think that I became an art historian in partly because I grew up on the hills and could see the city from my bedroom. Beautiful city. And I had my first experience of museums, of Shakespeare, and of public gatherings free on the National Mall. So I have a particular love for it. I moved back to Washington in 93 and um, got involved with mall things in the late 90s um, and was really quite astonished at the change um, that happened and that is continuing to happen. And I believe that the National Mall is something we all should care about and maybe get involved about because it's our national stage. Uh, our coalition first used the word stage for the mall in 2005, and we are very happy to see that now the Park Service and the Smithsonian and members of Congress refer to the mall as a stage. It's a metaphor change from a historic landscape, from museums and monuments, um, and we have our free mall map. I brought 50 copies if, uh, if you'd like to take. We've distributed over a million of those um, talking about the mall as the stage. So let's go ahead. Um, the mall is, of course, where we have our inaugurations every four years. It is very much the centerpiece of American politics. It's also where we have a uh, Fourth of July celebration of the Declaration of Independence and the founding of our country. It's a place people come to learn about our founding documents, history, art history, um, science. And of course, it's a place where the American public has taken to the open space and made it our own. We have truly made it the stage for democracy. 
We also, of course, have many monuments and memorials, and many more all the time. Um, uh, and they tell different aspects of our American story. And we also have museums. And as you're probably well aware, if you live in Washington, we have more museums all the time. And we'll talk about those as well, telling various aspects of American history. And above all, we have a transcendent architectural and landscape space um, outlined by the great classical um, buildings, uh, the great open spaces stretching between them, uh, flanked by our monuments, uh, the great open space at the heart of our democracy. In my view, uh, this is our American Acropolis. I teach all kinds of art history from the antiquity to the modern. I'm actually a medievalist, by, uh, my PhD. <laughs> um, but to me, it represents who we are. And so we have to be very careful about how we add to it, change it, because it I mean, go to the Athenian Acropolis, go to the Roman Forum. Now, of course, those are dead spaces, technically speaking, because the culture is no longer there. But we go there to understand those cultures. And people come from all over the world, and I talk to them. Um, and they ask me questions about them all because they care about what it says. So what are some of the challenges? Well, some of the challenges are, of course, security. For the past 30 years, we've been of finding that Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House was closed to traffic. And I know that probably is a good thing, but it sure was fun just to drive down Pennsylvania Avenue and wave to the president as you went by. Also, the west front of the Capitol building, which is a favorite place for tour guides to take people to get a beautiful view of the mall, has been closed to the public um, as well. And more recently, um, public gatherings, uh, the uh, uh, solar decathlon above, and the uh, Smithsonian uh, Folklife Festival, as well as the, um, uh, the uh, book festival, have been discouraged from the Park Service. Um, now, the Smithsonian Festival is still happening, but they've been pushed off to the side. The Solar Decathlon left. Uh, the National Book um, uh, uh, Celebration moved to the Convention Hall. And in my view, it's a sad um, loss. And we also have another issue, flooding. <laughs> um, as you probably are aware, if you get the print version of the Washington Post, this was December 31st of last year, um, a front page article, I think it's interesting to the topic I'm giving today, the top, the, uh, top article is repairing cracks in American democracy, and the lower one is a struggle to avoid drowning. Um, which was a five-page spread with maps uh, showing the deep problem Washington has because we're built on streams and creeks and we're built partly in the Potomac River. Open space versus new museums is something we hear a lot about. Um, we heard back in 2004 when the American Indian Museum opened, that was the last museum site on the mall. Well, then when the African American Museum opened in 2016, that was the last museum site on the mall. And of course, neither one is the last museum site on the mall because Congress has authorized a women's history museum as well as a American Latino um, museum for the mall. It's being held up right now for um, par uh, partially unknown reasons, but these two are intended for the mall. Of course, we have open space versus new memorials. This was uh, the state of the mall in 1980 or so. Our major monuments, Lincoln, Jefferson, the Capitol, and the White House. Uh, in 1982, we added Vietnam veterans. In 95, Korean veterans. 97, FDR. World War II in 2004. Uh, Congress was alarmed um, and uh, declared the mall a substantially completed work of civic art and then approved the Martin Luther King Memorial and the Eisenhower Memorial. Um, so it's clear that we've got um, a problem. National Desert Storm and Desert Shield Memorial is coming. They hope to have it completed in 2025. It's over by the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And these are the ones that Congress has approved. Um, Global War on Terror, Fallen Journalists, National Medal of Honor Memorial, all three of those want to be on the mall, and um, I think one of them has gotten a, a site on the mall, and women's suffrage. 
everyone wants to be on the mall. After all, it's the place that says you have arrived, your story has arrived. But we also have controversies that come with each. Um, back in the 1980s, um, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial design was criticized because rather than being a heroic statue of soldiers, uh, Maya Lin had designed these two walls cut into the soil and, and, and marked with the, the names of the dead. It didn't seem right to some people. The Martin Luther King Memorial has been criticized for the scale of the statue, uh, the gigantic 30-foot high uh, statue, also the issue that it was carved by a Chinese sculptor. And the World War II Memorial was argued over because of its site. Now, the design also became an issue, but uh, primarily it was the location on the reflecting pool of the Lincoln Memorial. So we were founded, actually, in response to the World War II Memorial. Um, that's us back in 1998. Uh, we were standing at the Rainbow Pool. It's the oval-shaped pool just behind us before the long rectangular reflecting pool. All of that was designed as part of the Lincoln Memorial. And that site then had been given uh, to the American Battle Monuments to build the memorial. And we brought a lawsuit along with um, quite a few other nonprofit organizations. But as you'll see, Congress intervened. Um, so this is the view before. Um, and this is, of course, the view after. Not only did it take over a portion of an existing memorial, but it enclosed the space with a sunken plaza, which means you no longer can pass through like you used to. So who makes these decisions? Well, this was the true shock we found the more we got into dealing with mall matters. Nobody makes decisions or everybody makes decisions. The different parts of the mall are overseen and managed by different entities. The Park Service, the Open Space, and the major monuments, the Smithsonian, the, memorial, uh, the uh, museums and gardens, the National Gallery has two buildings and a gar sculpture garden. GSA has in is in charge of all the public buildings surrounding the mall, and the architect of the Capitol has the whole eastern end uh, of the mall with the uh, Capitol, the, uh, the uh, Library of Congress, uh, the um, Supreme Court, and the House and Senate office buildings. It's even worse. <laughs> These are the entities that have authority over decision making by those other entities. Um, I've been asked by members of Congress and staff, could we have a copy of that? Uh, I think they understand the problem. We have 14 committees in Congress with jurisdiction over different agencies and different themes, such as like commemoration. Um, and we have DC agencies, the Zoning Commission, the Historic Preservation Office above. We have the federal agencies below, Commission of Fine Arts, National Capital Planning Commission. All of them have a say in what's going on. So essentially, nobody's in charge. And so we decided that we could fill some gaps. Um, one thing we did is we created the National Mall Map. There is no National Mall Map, or there was no National Mall Map in 2005. The Park Service has National Park Map which includes all the parks in the Washington area. The Smithsonian has a nice map, but it ends at the Washington Monument because that's where their museums end. So we thought we're going to give them, uh, the, the, the tourists, the visitor, uh, the whole mall as a designed unified space. And as I said, we've distributed over a million of these now, mostly at the airports, Dulles and National. Um, we also came up with an idea for how to deal with flooding uh, we called it the National Mall Underground. It would be an underground cistern under the mall. When not used for flooding, it could be used for holding tour buses um, and getting them off the street. Um, and, oh, the, the visuals are missing here, but we came up with the idea, and this is an idea actually that's being bantied around in Congress of expanding the mall boundaries. The first century mall, we'll talk a little more about that, is the original mall. The second century mall expanded the mall um, towards the Jefferson and Lincoln Memorial. We think that the third century mall could incorporate public lands on both sides of the Potomac River and allow space to grow. So today I want to focus particularly on commemorate, commemoration, past, present, and future. What story do we tell in the mall and what's missing? 
Well, well, let's look at um, the space. Let's look at the open space, the memorials um, and the museums. What do they tell? And can we determine what's missing? And can we fill them all with more missing chapters? Um, you may have seen recently and last summer, uh, there was a, uh, a, an exhibit, a month long exhibit on the mall called Beyond Granite. It was the Mellon Foundation in partnership with the Park Service and NCPC and the Park Service's fundraising partner, the Trust for the Mall, um, who put this together. Uh, the Mellon Foundation in the, in, the, uh, in, in the aftermath of the Rodney King and other uh, George Floyd um, uh, 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 murders, um, were, the Mellon Foundation um, was getting actively involved in the, uh, the, the questions we're raising about Confederate statues um, in public places. Um, and uh, so they actually have put millions of dollars into um, encouraging communities to think about what's missing, not just pull down sto uh, uh, statues, but uh, talk about what you could add. And so there were a few um, uh, examples on them all. So how did we get to this place? Well, we have to look at history if we want to understand. And I, as a historian, particularly love the history um, that we're going to be looking at, the visionary planning legacy. Um, when you look at the mall from the air, you can clearly see that there is an order, a geometry, and a symbolism to the layout. We have an east-west axis from the Capitol to the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial and a north-south axis from the White House to the Washington Monument to the Jefferson Memorial. In the center is this great open space for we the people. This geometry and this symbolism and this concept of architecture and open space and symbolism is the, the legacy of two historic plans, the 1791 L'Enfant Plan above and the 1902 Macmillan Plan below. The L'Enfant Plan conceived of the whole city, the whole capital, as a work of civic art. In 1790, Congress gave Gen uh, President George Washington the opportunity to choose the location of the new nation's capital. He chose the site at the, at the confluence of the Potomac and Anacostia rivers just upstream from Mount Vernon. And he asked um, Peter Charles L'Enfant, Peter signed his letters Peter. He didn't sign his letters Pierre. So, um, so we referred to him as Peter Charles L'Enfant, asked him to design a full-fledged city. Now, he worked with Thomas Jefferson as well. Thomas Jefferson had come up with his own plan, but um, L'Enfant thought that his little plan was tiresome and insipid. He was thinking bigger. Um, what he said is, the plan should be drawn on such a scale as to leave room for that aggrandizement and embellishment with the increase of the wealth of the nation will permit it to pursue at any period, however remote. Um, that was in his letter to George Washington in 1789. He and George Washington got on horseback and uh, traversed the rolling hills at the confluence of the, of the Potomac and the Anacostia. And he chose the highest spot, which he called a pedestal awaiting a monument, for the most important building. Now think about the date here. This is 1791. He had fought in the American Revolution alongside George Washington. He had been aware of the, um, the constitutional conventions. Um, the, the US Constitution had just been ratified, 1788. All of this, and of course, all the enlightenment ideas and ideals that went into the drafting and the writing of those documents. He wanted the most prominent spot in the middle of the city to be for the capital, the seat of representational government. What in Europe, of course, would have been a cathedral or a palace. Um, so he took the notion of European design, but now Americanized it. Um, a mile away, he put the White House. A mile away, not right next door. And he, was, uh, he said that he wanted the members to have time as they walked from one building to the other to ruminate, to think um, before acting. Um, and the Capitol became the centerpiece of the whole layout of the city, uh, the north, south, and east-west axis that make up the four quadrants in Washington, DC. So you know if you're ever lost, the first thing you want to do is see a sign, look in which quadrant you're in, 
then look at the street number. Uh, is it first, second, third, fourth, and is it A, B, C, D? And you know how far you are from the Capitol building if you'd like to go there. Um, so he, um, he designed uh, the two important uh, representational buildings and then where an axis south of the White House intersected an, uh, 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 an axis west from the Capitol, he put a monument to George Washington. Now Congress had already stated that there should be a monument to George Washington in whatever becomes the Capitol. Well, look what he did with it. He didn't just let, put it somewhere. He put it right at the intersection of the two main axes. And in between, he put a Grand Avenue, a, a place of public, a uh, place of general resort with public walks. And it was to be lined with embassies and chanceries. So this is the centerpiece of his city. He put Tiber Creek into Washington Canal, now under Constitution Avenue and causing all kinds of heartache as it keeps rising up. Um, and the Washington Monument was right then at the, uh, on the edge of the Potomac River, an important thing to notice. The avenues that um, overlaid the orthogonal grid of the residential streets, the avenues were all named for the original colonies. The most important avenue, of course, connecting the White House to the Capitol, named for the site of the Constitutional Conventions, Pennsylvania. In effect, he took the Constitution and made a city that is a physical embodiment of it. <laughs> As we would expect, uh, the vision was largely ignored in the 19th century. I love this view, 1840s. The cows appreciate it. There is the Capitol building um, on the pedestal awaiting a monument. Um, but the mall, which is the area to the right of where you're looking, um, is essentially still just empty farmland. Members of Congress were not living in Washington year round. And by the 1860s, uh, the mall was truly a mess. Um, the Washington Canal supposedly a beautiful waterway for traversing, uh, for moving up and down uh, east and west in the city, had become an open sewer, a fetid sewer. Um, there were uh, still um, Civil War buildings crossing the mall, and the only permanent building down there was the Smithsonian Castle. Here's a view in 1900. Uh, you can see the Sm Smithsonian Castle on the right, but the mall now is filled with trees buildings and meandering paths far from a Grand Avenue. And Congress has allowed the BNP Railroad to build a railroad station where we now have the National Gallery of Art, a railroad station right there with a train crossing at the foot of the Capitol. This is when the American Institute of Architects convinced Congress and in particular Senator McMillan of Michigan that we needed to clean up Washington um, and come up with a renewed vision. The Senate Park Commission, or the Macmillan Commission, uh, was made up of some of the top designers of the day, Daniel Burnham, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., Charles McKim, and the sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens. And they came up with a new plan. The first thing they did, though, was they went to Europe. They wanted to see the places that inspired L'Enfant. And they looked at his plan and decided they didn't need a new plan. They needed to renew that plan because they recognize the genius of it. And this is uh, the watercolor they made of their new concept. Um, here you can see uh, um, a beautiful drawing. Notice that the city, the residential areas around don't matter at all. Uh, this is a city beautiful mu um, uh, view from 1902 where the core of the city um, is turned into a beautiful architectural setting. But you see most prominently the Washington Monument is no longer along the banks of the Potomac River. Here, the L'Enfant and the, the Macmillan. So something rather drastic has happened. That is, the Army Corps of Engineers had dredged the Potomac and dumped that soil west and south of the Washington Monument. And the Macmillan Commission thought, well, let's expand the mall because we need a place for a monument to Abraham Lincoln a memorial to erected to the memory of that one man in our history as a nation who is worthy to be named with George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. So they're building on L'Enfant's concept, both the axis 
but also the symbolism and the historical narrative. And one south, one south, uh, and further south, uh, they put a monument um, to heroes of the revolution, what became the Jefferson Memorial. They also took an idea that had been floating around for some time for a bridge connecting Washington to Virginia, and they designed the Mor Memorial Bridge to be located in a specific location, that is, at the Lincoln Memorial, connecting the Lincoln Memorial to Arlington Cemetery and Arlington House, which had been in the family of Robert E. Lee. So even the bridge has a symbolic as well as physical connection. And this was their vision. Now they knew that in order to convince Congress and the president of anything, they needed beautiful visuals. And so they came up with these beautiful watercolors. Um, this plan was never accepted or ratified by Congress. However, it has become the basis of, of the mall. You can see here, uh, they wanted the Washington Monument actually to be a very elaborate landscape, but they opened up the, uh, the uh, open space, um, put, lined it with trees, and put white classical buildings. You can see certain similarities with um, Versailles. Here you can see they intended there to be plentiful pools and fountains, and we were supposed to have all white classical architecture, the Beaux-Arts architecture um, of the City Beautiful movement. What about the Smithsonian Castle? Gone. It did not conform to the vision. They were not going to make accommodation. It was to be gone. So that was the vision. What was the reality? Well, in 1922, the Lincoln Memorial was completed, um, but you can see that very little else. Up at the Capitol end, it, the, build, the, the, the mall is still filled with trees and buildings. The Washington Monument, kind of an empty space uh, surrounded by trees. And we had ball fields um, near the Washington Monument as well. Only the building, only the great classical temple um, modeled on the Parthenon in Athens had been completed. What are these? World War I temporary buildings. Um, America had entered World War I. We had all the soldiers and administrators coming to Washington, and the only big open space was the mall. And so we had Maine Navy and other buildings placed there to the north of the, of the pool. But by the 1960s, and this is how I remember the mall as a child, by the 60s, the whole area between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln was covered with temporaries. These were now World War II two temporary buildings on the south. World War I buildings were still in place. It wasn't until the mid-1970s with the bicentennial in 1976, and partly inspired by Richard Nixon's um, uh, calling for the removal of the tempos, that finally we ended up with this grand open space we know today. So when we look at the mall today, we are in fact very much looking at the Macmillan vision, Memorial Bridge connecting Virginia and, and Washington, uh, the arrangement of the, um, of the uh, monuments, and the grand open space at the center. The Macmillan Commission was very clear that what they were doing was a combination of vistas, monuments, and open space. It was truly a work of civic art, and this is what they said. This was Henry Bacon. The site in Potomac Park was the best one for a monument to Abraham Lincoln. We have at one end of the axis of the mall, a beautiful building, which is a monument to the United States government, the Capitol. At the other end of the axis, we have the possibility, it was still early, of a memorial to the man who saved the government, Lincoln. And between the two is a monument to its founder, George Washington. And then he went on, all three of these structures stretching in one grand sweep from Capitol Hill to the Potomac River, will lend one to the others, the associations and memories connected with each, and each will have its value increased by being on the one axis and having the visual relationship. So this was all clearly laid out as a design, as a symbolism, um, um, as meaning. And now that the mall had been opened up, cleaned up, people could take to it in ways they never did. First, we saw the Lincoln Memorial early on was becoming already a stage. 
Marian Anderson in 1939, singing on the steps of the Lincoln. Martin Luther King with the March on Washington in 1963, speaking to the people assembled. Um, Anti-Vietnam War um, and anti-Iraq War demonstrations on the Mall. And of course, the great celebrations of our uh, founding and, and uh, of the learning that one gets from the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. And what happened next? Well, we had shifting values. On the one hand, we started with the classical architecture that Macmillan intended, but by the 1960s and 70s, we were shifting towards modern architecture. So a change taking place. Uh, it didn't happen without plenty of struggle. Some people wanted classical to maintain, but we see I.M. Pei's uh, National Gallery on the left and the uh, African American Museum on the right. We also started with classical temples um, called for by the Macmillan Commission, um, but with the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, uh, Martin Luther King, we've moved to modern and new types of memorials. We also have shifting values in the story told. We saw the addition of the story of the Amer indigenous peoples, the Native Americans or the American Indian. Um, then we saw the addition of the African American Museum and in the upper right, um, is uh, the press conference for the Women's History Memorial Museum and down below the American Latino. These are ongoing. As I said, they've been given authority, um, but there's some uh, controversy about the nature of the exhibits that are being developed. And so some members of Congress are um, a little unsettled about um, finalizing. Um, we see um, that at uh, yeah, trying to think what I was going to say here. <laughs> um, uh, the the proliferation of uh, memorials uh, down at the Lincoln end. That's the Vietnam on the left, upper left, uh, upper right is the Korean Veterans Memorial, um, FDR with its uh, figural sculpture and much more, and the Martin Luther King with its colossal um, kind of uh, memorial. So we're shifting. Uh, away from the standard types uh, towards new kinds of forms, and often it comes with a controversy, as we probably know. Memorials also, though, are in conflict with the public open space. Um, around the Lincoln Memorial, we saw a space that had been used for softball and, and other recreational sports, now taken over by war memorials. And Congress, in the immediate aftermath of approving the Korean Veterans Memorial, realized something had to be done. There were calls in Congress of memorial mania. How are we gonna protect them all? And so they passed in 1986, the Commemorative Works Act. Um, and notice the purposes, the most important purposes, to preserve the integrity of the comprehensive design of the L'Enfant and Macmillan plans. Second, ensure the continued public use and enjoyment of open space. And third, preserve, protect, and maintain the limited amount of open space available. All good intentions, um, a brilliant law that in fact never has been tested, and that's what we were testing with our a lawsuit against the World War II Memorial. We were claiming all three of these provisions had been violated. Um, uh, uh, the art cr architecture critic Ben Forge of the Washington Post, he said, oh yes, Commemorative Works Act, significant procedural roadblocks to new memorials. Well, of course, we continued to build FDR, World War II, and Martin Luther King. Um, the World War II Memorial caused national controversy on left and right, members of Congress, um, uh, and it led Congress to, first of all, approve it, Notwithstanding any other provision of law, the World War II Memorial shall be constructed expeditiously at the dedicated Rainbow Pool site. Um, one reason that we uh, had such verve with our lawsuit is because many of us, not I, were World War II veterans, and they found this, notwithstanding any provision of law, to be an absolute insult, and they were furious. Um, so we had also World War II veterans to save them all. We were originally founded as the National Coalition to Save Our Mall. Congresswoman Norton kind of helped us design our name. She said, national, make it national. <laughs> so first of all, they said, build the darn thing. 
And then secondly, they said, they passed legislation calling them all a substantially completed work of civic art. No more of this, moratorium on new memorials. Well, of course, <laughs> um, the Desert Storm Memorial groundbreaking took place in July, 2022. Now, this is just a ceremonial, you can see there's a box of dirt and uh, they're still trying to raise money. So it shows that you're making progress. Um, but it, I don't think any dug, uh, dirt has been dug yet. But next up, Global War on Terror and Medal of Honor Memorial. The other problem, Memorials versus Public Open Space, part two. We have the Vietnam Veterans Memorial that has grown to be one of the most beloved memorials. However, early on, there was opposition because there wasn't a statue, to, of a, a heroic statue of soldiers. And so the statue was added soon after it was completed. And then there was comment that, well, women and nurses had not been commemorated. So we added the women's memorial. And then um, those who had died as a result of Agent Orange, including some prominent sons of members of Congress, said, we need to honor them as well. So the plaque was put over by the memorial, uh, the, 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 um, the, uh, the three soldiers memorial. So we have one memorial that now doesn't seem to be able to do what it needs to do, and different groups are asking for more. This you may not know about. Then in 2010, Congress authorized the Vietnam Veterans Commission to build an underground visitor center and education center. And we were all involved in trying to oppose what we thought was a redundant uh, uh, um, uh, um, facility that would have just detracted from the Vietnam Veterans Memorial itself. But um, ceremonial digging took place, but in 2018, they dropped the project because they simply couldn't raise money. Um, the FDR Memorial, four rooms of uh, his uh, four administrations, um, also got a new statue. The disability community objected that there he was shown with a giant cloak that, that hid the fact that he was in fact disabled and yet lived uh, and, and, and performed under great uh, stress a very successful presidency. And so we added this. The Korean Veterans Memorial, this one hasn't gotten much news because it happened during uh, COVID, um, but apparently they thought, well, you know, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, so much of its power comes from the names. People want to rub the names. They want to touch the names. They want to feel connected to those who died. So now there is a new wall at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial with the names of uh, thousands of those who died. The World War II Memorial is not alone. Um, it, is, it is just last year, I think it was, um, got um, uh, a new prayer plaque. Um, it's the FDR's um, a prayer that he said when he made his address um, after D-Day. And so that has been dedicated. Um, and this is just one thing I want to add, because this is something that has been troubling accompaniment to adding more memorials. What happens is, especially when memorials are commemorating the dead, they become sacred spaces and you're not allowed to play or to laugh or to run. Now, of course, the World War II Memorial was located over what had been a rainbow pool. And so they put in the pool with beautiful fountains, but people are not allowed to put their feet in them or play in them. So again, what we're doing is we're taking heretofore public open space. And I re referred to this, and actually it was quoted by many others, that we have moved um, Arlington Cemetery across the Memorial Bridge. We've created almost a memorial um, cemetery zone in this part of the um, in this part of the mall, and then there's grass versus public space. Um, 2016, public funds were used by the National Park Service to finally clean up the grass, put in beautiful new grass. But as a result, they now do not want to give permits to public use. They say that the public use, such as the Solar Decathlon and the Book Festival, will damage the grass. And the National Capital Planning Commission is now going along with the National Park Service and has come up with their Pennsylvania Avenue initiative, in part to clean up Pennsylvania Avenue, which needs it, but in part 
Now they're calling Pennsylvania Avenue our civic stage. They're trying to get everybody shifted over to Pennsylvania Avenue. In my view, we're draining the mall of a very important function. Why can't we just do like soccer stadiums do all over the world and put in specially treated grass that can handle it? Who decides? Oh, all my colors are gone. <laughs> <laughs> It's so much more fun with all those colors. But who decides? Well, it's not the public. It is these different government agencies and these different overseeing bodies that decide. And because the memorial and the museum has to go through so many steps, often the final design you end up with is nothing like the one you started with. That's certainly the case with the World War II memorial. Um, after the first design was thrown out, uh, the new design came back, and it had a coffin. Well, the coffin was gone. Um, and then, it, what else did it have? It had a few other things that have disappeared. The Martin Luther King was supposed to be dedicated to the man, the message, uh, the movement. Wait a minute. The man, the movement, and the message, I think it was. Well, that all got whittled down. The water elements got eliminated. And so we've seen what we're looking at is sometimes the end run of a very long process. And here I bring us back to the original plans, uh, the L'Enfant and the Macmillan plans that gave us what we need to um, deal with. The 1791 plan, the mall was the symbol of the US Constitution. The 1902 plan was a symbol of our reunification as a country. What do we have now? What is driving us? Well, right now, it's whoever gets to Congress first. So what, we, what, what our small coalition has been calling for, we need a new commission. It's been 124 years since the Macmillan Commission. We need a new paradigm. What do we want the mall to say? Um, we need a plan to go along with it for the mall, what we call the third century mall. We could, uh, what could a new public commission that we're calling for do? Well, think of a few ideas. These are just throwing out a few ideas. Instead of having more and more war memorials, each separate, why don't we build a war museum? This is like the, uh, the uh, war, uh, war museum in Manchester, England. We could put them all together where they could be shown in relationship to one another. World War I and World War II were directly related. Vietnam, directly related with Korea. We could tell a more coherent story. We can have grass and solar decathlon. I'd love to see the solar decathlon come back. The energy department was sponsoring it, but the Park Service wouldn't give permits in 2011, so they had to move. We can have new memorials and museums that continue to tell a story that's never been told. And the way we can do it is to expand the mall. The original first century mall ended at this pink line here the what we call the first century mall, L'Enfant's Mall. The mall expanded as the Potomac River um, moved westward. It's, it's, and this, the second century mall, more than doubled the size of the mall. We think we can expand again to the third century mall. And in the process, maybe rope in some of the existing presidential monuments, uh, the LBJ Memorial Grove, the Teddy Roosevelt Island, and the Kennedy Center, among others. So we can take what's already there, but of course we need a designer to bring it all together. We can renew the legacy, the legacy of this great place as a work of civic art, a place that intends by its architecture, its vistas, its open space, to make you feel uplift, inspired, good, do we want more more memorials? Is that what we want to say? Or can we say, look at what we've got? Now, when I give talks, the people, I give talks from Road Scholar and um, Elder Hostel and different groups that come to Washington, and I give them a talk, and the first thing they say is, oh, we were just down on the mall, and it's so beautiful. What is it you don't like? I said, no, I love it. But then at the end of my talk, they go, oh, what can we do? What can we do? So it's a beautiful framework. Let's keep it. We can create a new paradigm. What? This is just my suggestion. Civics education. Um, you're seeing all the time now, op-eds, articles. Um, Danielle Allen on the upper left 
She's been writing opinions for the Washington Post about how to fix democracy. Um, uh, and on the right is just a David Brooks um, recent piece. Um, Richard Haas has written the Bill of Obligations. He said, okay, we've done the Bill of Rights. We now know that we need to give rights to all these underappreciated peoples, but now we need to turn it back on citizens and say, but you've got obligations to keep this democracy strong. Um, PBS has series. Um, it, it's everywhere you look, you'll find, um, oh, and the Capital Historical Society has been working on civics education for some time, and the National Park Service as well on their website. So we've got the foundations, but who's using them? And can we use them? Can we take the citizenship test? Daniel Pink just wrote a piece about his wife, just got citizenship. He said, why don't we all have to take this test? I mean, figure out how your government works. So how do we do it? Well, these are just a few ideas. The George Mason Memorial, most people don't know. It's over by the, uh, by the Jefferson Memorial, and it's a lovely little memorial. But he's sitting there all by himself because he was sponsored by a Virginia group um, because he wrote the Virginia, um, the Virginia uh, uh, Declaration of Rights, which actually helped inspire Thomas Jefferson as well. So he wrote the Virginia Declaration. Well, what's he doing on the mall? Well, I suggest we could add James Madison. We could add other members. Um, who were involved in the writing of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and turn it into something that's specifically related to the mall. And then we've got this park called Constitution Gardens. Now, originally it was called Constitution Gardens because it's gone on Constitution Avenue. This is where the tempos were. But then in 1986, I think it was, um, President Reagan designated it a monument to the Constitution. So, why don't we put some constitutional figures in there? Make it fun, make it interesting. All these school teachers, I just got a call from one uh, a few hours before I came down. I'm bringing 25 eighth graders from Colorado. Can you send me a map? Yes. Um, but you know, that they, they want interesting things on the mall because they're coming for their once in a lifetime tour. The Martin Luther King Memorial, instead of just being about him, let's put in some more. This is Bernard Rustin, uh, the new movie about his role. Let's put in more about the message. We could populate that very empty plaza with all kinds of activity. And they don't even have to be permanent. It could be temporary. They could be revolving. And then walking on the mall, I've done it with sixth graders. Two miles from the Capitol to the Lincoln Memorial, trudging along, what to do. Could we make it a little more interesting? Now, the Einstein Memorial at 23rd and Constitution is a favorite. It not only has a real human being, but it has a place to sit. Um, and people just love it. But, you know, it's, it's not modern. It's not abstract. But, you know, people relate. Um, could we, for instance, take the notion, the concept of Statuary Hall in the Capitol, where every state has, gets to choose two people their own, they, don't, they could be the dog catcher for all we know. Two people to be placed in Statuary Hall. Could we take that concept and bring it out on the mall? So, can we have a third century mall that allows us by expanding, by having a new plan, by having a new paradigm that can fill our needs? And then there's the question, do we need more memorials or do we need maybe more museums? Do we need a memorial that keeps growing? as people say, well, it doesn't quite tell enough of the story. We historians know if you live long enough, that what you learned in college is totally irrelevant to what we now interpret uh, historical fact. Um, so this is not surprising, and it's actually quite interesting, but it's filling up our space. Um, the FDR Memorial, seven acres, four rooms. It is a museum, but it takes up even more space than a museum would. How about putting these kinds of things into a museum? When the American Indian Museum first opened, it was considered a failure by many people, including me. The content inside didn't make any sense. I couldn't follow any narrative. It was essentially about different individual uh, Indian tribes, but it didn't tell a story. Um, and it soon became clear. And they did an overhaul of the, well, you can do that with a museum. You have curators, you have exhibit space, you can change the story over and over again. Um, just recently, you've been hearing how uh, the 
the skulls and the bodies that had been taken from indigenous peoples and even African Americans are in anthropological museums. They've been told to shut down. So you can change. You can come up with new exhibits. And until it gets built, the Women's History Museum has been staging now exhibits to try to educate people. So why a third century mall plan now? Because these problems aren't going away. And no one has the charge to do it. We do it for us, for the American people, and for American democracy. This is the place the American people have made their own. And I believe that the Lincoln Memorial is so successful, not just because it's a beautiful building, but because it has multiple functions. It's not just about Lincoln. It is a podium. You can use it for anything. It's facing the mall, so you can use it as a platform to make a statement. It's not hidden away telling a private story. It's here talking to the open space. And I, this, is, this was a <laughs> David Bush. Um, could planning for the mall of the future be a cure for what's ailing our democracy? That's a challenge I'd like to put out there. Thank you very much. Well, I'd be happy to take questions, comments. Yes? And I'll, and I'll repeat the questions for the audience. OK, yes? Yeah, the, the question is, with the time-wise, the, how does the long, long fall plan relate to Philadelphia then being the capital? Well, Philadelphia was the capital, but was also a historic city that had a plan. And in, as a matter of fact, some people wanted L'Enfant to follow um, the Philadelphia grid and plan. But Philadelphia's design was already long extant before that. So L'Enfant was just coming up with a plan, like really out of Europe. It was not out of any American city. Um, the only thing he incorporated from Thomas Jefferson was a, a mall. Thomas Jefferson actually wanted a mall in the center, a public space. Um, and uh, and L'Enfant put that in there. Yes? Yeah, so. Now, I hear the question here is that um, his, his pet peeve is the first street at Pennsylvania Avenue at the foot of the Capitol um, is a parking lot, a parking lot for members of Congress and staff and so on. How in the world does that fit? And asking me, I've been talking about the grand vision because my theme was commemoration. Do we have any smaller ideas? Yes, we have plenty of smaller ideas. Um, and they include parking, which is one reason we wanted this underground cistern not to just be a cistern to collect flood water, but to have multiple purposes. We put a visitor center in it too. I mean, if you've ever been on the mall before the museum's open, there's no restroom, there's nowhere to get water, nothing. Um, so we put that in. We also put in a geothermal. So we've, we've been trying to show, um, and you, know, you, you hope someone's listening, we've been trying to show that if instead of the Smithsonian putting a cistern to collect flood water under each museum, if you put a giant cistern under the central panels of the mall, it can serve the National Gallery as well. And it can serve um, the Park Service. It can serve other entities. Well, their budget and their planning is limited to the Smithsonian property. We've been trying to show what happens if you take what everybody needs, and I know I've been doing this for 25 years, you know what they need, and put them into one facility. So. That's why that, the, 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 the National Mall Underground, if you go to our website and look it up, it's got visitor center, it's got, um, it's got uh, rain cisterns, it's got under, uh, the, the geothermal, 
Um, it has a number of things that we packed into it. And engineers say it all can be done. And the Army Corps said it could solve the flooding problem. Um, so it's out there. It's waiting. Um, parking, of course. Um, nobody wants parking. The Park Service and the NCPC don't want parking for cars. So we're focusing on buses because we all would like to see the buses off the street. But yes, I mean, the little, the little issues are specific to individual entities. And that's where we participate in what's called the Section 106 Historic Preservation Public Consultation Process. And anytime a change is going to be made, the agencies have to have this process. And I've been going to them for 25 years. I'm often the only member of the public to attend. Um, but I just feel somebody has to be there trying to represent the public interest. So look at our website. You'll see other things as well. Yes, you had a question. Mm -hmm. It would have been lovely. So the, the point, the question here is, am I aware that Cass Gilbert wanted to extend the mall to the east, east of the Capitol, and then put the Supreme Court, it would have been on the Anacostia River. Yes, I'm aware of that. I'm also aware that when the Macmillan Commission, before they came up with their plan, um, they had their American Institute of Architects annual meeting in 1900 in Washington. And the idea was, to get everybody talking about the need for a plan for Washington. I think Cass Gilbert also wanted to move the White House. Um, one of the architects said it was too swampy down there. They wanted to move it up 16th Street to higher ground. I have all the plans. I mean, it's a, it's a hoot to look at what they wanted to do. Um, some of them wanted to keep the trees all over the mall because that was a nice Victorian garden. But imagine, we never could have used the space. So. Um, Yes, I mean, there are plenty of ideas out there. Actually, uh, he wanted to put the Supreme Court there. Uh, my colleague, uh, Arthur Cotton Moore, he was a vice chair of the coalition. He did a design for the expansion of the mall, and he expanded the White House Washington Monument Jefferson axis by creating a, by taking the landfill and reshaping it to the south, and he was going to put the Supreme Court there. So you'd have the White House, the Capitol, and the Supreme Court in a, in a triangle, which I thought was a brilliant idea um, um, because he knew, he understood the plans, he understood the symbolism, he also understood the need. Uh, I'm not sure who's next, yes? Yeah. Yeah, the question is about what, where do I come down on public versus private money? Um, I wouldn't put, I wouldn't say just because it's private money that the quality goes down because we have a Frank Gehry Memorial, um, the Eisenhower Memorial, just across from the Air and Space Museum. And uh, he had a big idea, but the big idea is gone. Um, and what we're left with is a plaza with individual elements that don't make any sense. Now, as for private money, that's what Congress has been telling everyone. You can't build here, including museums, unless you find private money. We're not going to fund it. Now, they did provide money for the American Indian and for the African American. Um, they may eventually give some money to the upcoming memorials, museums. But the um, Desert Storm and Desert Shield, I was reading their website yesterday. They, Congress told them, you have to have private money. 
in order to do this. And if you don't get the money, you don't have a monument. Now, the John Adams Memorial, ever seen it? No, they never got there. Now, John Adams would have made good sense down by the Thomas Jefferson Memorial. How about the Peace Garden? Never got money. I believe this should be public money in which the public is involved and we decide what kind of story we want to tell. Right now, we're kind of selling parts of the mall. It's almost like the 19th century where you had industrial buildings and a railroad station on the mall because Congress doesn't care enough to do something. And if you raise the issue of a commission, which we've been raising for 20 years, all the commissions say, oh, no, we're already a commission. Yes, and we have all these laws and nothing changes. So ultimately, it's going to be the president or a member of Congress or something um, that's going to take the, the leadership. Um, and I hope it's before I die. <laughs> yes? Can I comment on the food trucks? The food is <laughs> the food is great. The view is awful. I think that the city shouldn't allow them on the cross streets. The cross street should be a continuum. And when you see them all stacked up there, well, you know why? I mean, because our visitor center hasn't been built. It will have food in it. Um, uh, um, see, the, the part of the problem, and the Macmillan Commission is to blame for this too, is they cut off the mall from the living city. Uh, it used to be, what was it, Murder Alley or something. The, the areas around the mall in the eight, late 19th century were residential. They were filled with people. But the Macmillan Commission, one of their first tasks was to provide buildings for the federal workforce. Because after the World War, after Civil War, Washington had grown exponentially. The government had grown exponentially. They didn't have any place to put them. So the federal triangle was their solution. We've got those massive, and as a kid, I just remember thinking it was, I just didn't like them, forbidding. They're classical, but they're not classical where you can walk in them. They're lifted up, uh, you know, two stories. Um, so what it did is it separated the city. And so food, you either have to go into a museum or you have to walk blocks. So I can understand, but I do believe they should not be allowed on the cross streets so that we have a continuous view. Yes? Right. So the question is, uh, do I think there should be some solemn places on the mall as, a, as, a, a, as well as um, uh, public, joyful, recreational spaces? Absolutely. Um, the Lincoln Memorial is one such spot. The Park Service allows you, and I've been there with kids who come and read their essays standing on the steps of the mall, but they're not allowed uh, to step all the way up to the marble steps. They're allowed to go only partway up the steps of the Lincoln to the granite steps um, because above the marble is considered to be the sacred space. That's fine. That's good. That makes good sense. You can still use the, the podium, the steps. Uh, you can use the backdrop, all of that. Um, but the problem is when we keep adding memorials on what used to be polo grounds and baseball grounds. I mean, the residents of Washington have used the mall and increasingly they're being denied use of the mall. Now, once the desert storm goes up, it's another ball field over by the Vietnam Veterans Memorial that's gonna be gone. So this isn't thought out. What happens is someone says, I wanna be on the mall, and the, uh, the um, global war on terror. Now, there is a rule that says a war has to be done, done over for 20 years before you build a monument. So Congress apparently has decided that we have won the global war on terror, and approved a monument 
they want to be near the Vietnam Veterans Memorial because there is, you know, a whole now host of Vietnam Veterans Memorials, different ones, and the global war on terror can be there. Essentially, that's fine, but it belongs in Arlington Cemetery. And if we had a museum there and there's a giant parking lot, put it right on top of the parking lot, there's plenty of space, then you could have these commemorative zones. And that's what a cemetery is. You're not supposed to run around and, and, and whistle and sing and play in the water. And that's totally understandable. But the mall is supposed to be lively, vibrant, active, fun. Like democracy is supposed to be active. <laughs> yes? Well, you're young enough to um, not remember when people were, I mean, we just all followed orders back years ago, decades ago. I'm totally in favor of once you get to the top of the Lincoln Steps, to the, that that is sacred place. You go in and it just gives you chills. The statue is so powerful. The writings on the wall are so powerful. Um, and we just, it's very hard, and believe me, I know a lot of teachers and tour guides, to try to keep order anymore. I mean, when we went to the mall, we were wearing dresses and saddle shoes. And when, you know, that was, you know, the old, nowadays, I mean, the, the, the just behavior is different. But I think the Park Service tries to maintain that, but the Park Service is underfunded as well and understaffed. So, um, you know, we could all use some education about these monuments, and uh, I think I think it would help. I think it would help. Now, I wanted to mention one thing. My friend Kent Cooper, he was also on the board. Um, he died a few years ago. He was he took up the Korean Veterans Memorial after the original designers left, and he finished the Korean Veterans Memorial. But he also worked on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. He was the architect of record for Maya Lin. You have to have an architect in town. Well, Kent was the architect of record, so he worked closely with her. And he said, I always said that when memories of Vietnam kind of fade away, let's just fill it in. And I thought, genius. I mean, it's a giant memorial. We needed it at the time because the whole country was broken apart, families broken apart by opposition and, 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 and so on. But it is built in such a way that you could simply fill it in there'd be a slight mound there. And I thought, now that's a lovely idea. You can have memorials um, disappearing and coming back. I've thought that the World War II Memorial just needs lots of ivy, lots and lots of <laughs> ivy. <laughs> yes? Yes. Yes, it, it has been. Uh, the question is, um, you know, you've got all these different agencies, but nobody seems to be taking responsibility or a bigger vision. Um, do you have an idea where that comes from? Well, when I got started in the late 1990s, I used to take my students. I was in the Washington semester program and I'd take my students to the Commission of Fine Arts. That's when Carter Brown, who was also the head of the National Gallery, headed it. I disagreed with him on a lot of stuff, but he was smart. He understood the plans. He understood good, good aesthetics. Um, when I went, went to NCPC, um, they had these brilliant planners who understood the L'Enfant plan and Macmillan plan. 
then they ended up on my board um, because, and I was very honored by that because when they re retired, they'd come join my board because we were all trying to fight. But what happened is you're absolutely right. There's, the leadership just hasn't happened. The people in positions are perfectly functional, but we've asked the Commission of Fine Arts many times, take the lead. You were created in 1910 by Congress with a specific purpose of upholding the Macmillan Plan. But what they do is they get reviews, they look at the, the Eisenhower Memorial design and they said, well, could you make the statue a little smaller? Or could you make the wall a little higher? When, when you go to these meetings and you realize that they're not feeling empowered, the members, um, and then the rest of us, I mean, we push, we want them to take leadership, but it's, it's just, it's, it's really, it's disappointing, I will say. And Arthur Moore said the same thing, Kent Cooper, George Oberlander, he was on my board. He just passed away a few months ago. Most of my board members were World War II veterans. Um, so, you know, we're all slowly disappearing. Um, but no, it is, um, it's difficult. Now, I think if somebody took the lead and said, we're going to create an independent mall commission, publicly funded with members of the public on it too, everyone would want to be on it because they don't want to be left out. But right now, they don't want anybody stepping on their toes. And the thing is, you can understand it. My dad worked for the government. Um, I didn't. But you know, when, when you're in an agency, you have an annual budget. And the budget is for you have to make your priorities. Well, here, this coalition group is saying, think big. We can't think big. We don't have the budget, which is why it's not necessarily their fault. It's just that we need an authority higher. Now, Central Park in New York had the same problem. You had the city, and you had the governor, and you had the New Jersey, and you had everybody all involved. And they created the, uh, the Central Park Conservancy. And it's an overarching body that brings people together and coordinates with the others. That's what we need. We need something like that. Who, who should champion? Well, who, who championed the Central Park Conservancy were all the people that live around it. Yeah, it was all the people that live in the high rises that use Central Park. And it was a crime infested, terrible mess in the 1960s and 70s. But they wanted their park. I mean, you can understand if you've been to New York, it's, you know, what's, what's a park there? It's a strip of grass. Um, there they had this beautiful park and they banded together and got private money and, and, and got the governor and got the mayor. Um, we don't have that. We've got the nation. Well, how do you get the nation involved? If you create a commission, maybe you could do that. Yes? Well, they can join the Section 106 historic preservation process, and they can comment. Um, but the um, uh, NCPC, um, you know, th this, there was a Pennsylvania Avenue plan in 1973, because Pennsylvania Avenue, President John F. Kennedy was riding in the motorcade at his inauguration and saw the boarded up buildings. So we had a plan in 1973, and that was partially implemented. Um, the private entities, Johns Hopkins now there, uh, the Canadian Embassy, they can comment, but um, NCPC is moving ahead and they have federal funds to, unfortunately, hire British people and Brit hire people from out of the city when we've got some of the most knowledgeable people, architects and designers in the city, but that's the way things work. I don't know what's going to happen. I think the Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative is not going to go very far because nobody lives on Pennsylvania Avenue. And so you're not going to get people excited. And tourists, why would they go to Pennsylvania Avenue? They want to be on the mall. They're coming for the museums. And people who are protesting, you want the Washington Monument in your picture. You want the Capitol in your picture. You don't want the Treasury Building. You know, so this is... This is the problem. You know, they're thinking like urban designers, but not about people and the purpose of a stage, which is to be in the national spotlight. 
in front of and around all of these monuments. So you're welcome. Well, thank you very much. And if you know the president, ask him if he would create a commission. Uh, just a few, few remarks to, to wrap up. I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Of course, thank you. You've, you've given us so much to think about. And I think I, I spend a lot of time on the mall. And I'm going to be looking at it differently and experiencing it differently. And, and so we, we certainly appreciate you um, giving us these perspectives of, about this important public space that, that we all share here. Uh, I do want to also extend uh, thanks to Rob DeHart, our curator, who's been running the tech and is really the, the champion of our, our lecture series, as, as well as Amy Durbin, who's hiding behind the uh, wall back there, and Alana Stolnitz, who's monitoring this um, remotely from an undisclosed location somewhere uh, somewhere else. Um, I uh, want to invite everybody to come back next month for the next program in our lecture series on April 23rd. Archaeologist Carrie Burrell Tams of Dovetail Cultural Resources Group will lead a discussion about some of the discoveries that have been made here at Tudor Place, and, and most recently, the discovery of a uh, uh, possible enslaved home space in the orchard area just on the other side of the fence from, from where we are. And I would mention that um, that archaeological discovery is, is featured prominently in our new in installation called Ancestral Spaces, which is looking at the people of African descent who lived and worked here at Tudor Place. We want to extend an invitation to all of you, if you have not had that experience yet, to please do so. Uh, we have some information here on these little bookmarks. I'll put them uh, over, over here so you can pick those up. So hopefully you will, will join us for that. Um, I've committed a couple of cardinal sins. This evening I came up here without a membership brochure to show you. Uh, I saw somebody had one. Hold, hold your membership brochure. Uh, there are some by the door. If you're interested in supporting what you what you have experienced this evening and the things that we do here to uh, to preserve Tudor Place and to tell the stories of of this special place and of our community, I um, hope that you will take a moment this evening to uh, to become a member. The other cardinal sin that I have committed, I did not introduce Laura Will, a member of our Board of Trustees, who is here this evening. So, Laura, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm so glad to have you here this evening, and I think that's all that uh, I had planned to say. So we can we can call it good night with one more. I just want to remind you that the mall map is over there, and if you want to get on, in touch with me, it's my phone number on the back. Thank you.